Well, listen, mate, thanks for talking to us. I really appreciate you taking the time to do that. As always, very give, giving of your time, as you always are. No problem. Um, and again, you know, thanks for... I did name check you last night for coming up with the original idea when we were sitting there. You were like, John, you need to do one of your newsrooms. That's what you need to do. Yeah. Yeah. Pal, pal, as you always call me. You need to do one of your newsrooms, pal. And here we yeah. are, um, six weeks later. Perfect. I mean, really, with COVID-19, it's been a perfect time to organise it. I managed to throw myself yeah. into it for six weeks um, and yeah. test it out with the equipment that we've got, really. I mean, we've not been able to borrow anything. We've bought a few items between the two of us, myself and Julian. But... It showed that it works, doesn't it? You know, yeah. we, we, even in lockdown, with, with, with the equipment, and everybody now seems to know about Zoom, don't they? So yeah. it's, 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 it's great, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it weighs in. Yeah, I think also you know the, the the opportunity to do something like this maybe through the night with around mental health as well that kind of you know midnight caller kind of stuff I think would 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 yeah, serve quite well. Yeah. Yeah. I, that, that, you might want to talk yourself into the next twenty four hour news. Yeah, I think that'd be really good to do that. Actually, I'm quite keen to yeah. do that. Yeah, I know um, Mark and Cat at Time to Change were quite keen around the sort of a, you know young people's mental health conversations and newsrooms and stuff. But yes. I think you know. Between the two of us doing something that we could, you know, have conversations and those that people that want to be filmed that we could film, just maybe sharing yeah. some experiences. It was interesting talking to John a minute ago about, you know, nine eleven and being there when the towers came down and, you know, not really feeling as if like, you know, it's traumatised him almost because he made a decision to do something about it. And it's quite interesting, isn't it? The impact of mental health on people uh, around yeah. crisis and conflict and stuff. Yes. And, uh, you know, this time is really... You know, with the six week period and the plus is, is really high for all these issues there predictably. So yeah, it's the right time, mate. Yeah, cool. Can I can I just touch before we start as well, talking about the the, the Holocaust and the subject we talk about quite a lot, and just mentioning sort of Kev Ryan, you know, because again, you know, I was quite, you know, sad to hear about him passing and him having that I don't know Kev very well, you know, I want class us as friends, more of an acquaintance, but in the three times that I've dealt with him, each time he's been very giving of his time um, for free in order to bring the Life in War exhibit to Leicester from Loughborough uh, with Majid Saidi. And, I, and he was always very much interested in the fact that Majid's work was very, I think it's still the only major documentary photography body of work that's not about war fighting in relation to Afghanistan. It's only about the impact on civilians. I mean, you know, just, just in a couple of sentences, how did you know Kev and how did you come across him? Well, I came across Kev, oh, 20 plus years ago when I was doing some work in uh, the county areas of with, with regard to social exclusion, rural poverty, that sort of stuff. And Kev was, uh, obviously he was, he was at Charwood Arts then, he seems to have always been in Charwood yeah. Arts. And, uh, <laughs> but he, he, he was like, not just a visionary person, he was a gentleman, you know, he, 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 he sort of had that, that, that way of connecting with people. It didn't matter their age, it didn't matter their ethnicity, it didn't matter where they came from, it didn't matter what, you know, he, he was able to make links, um, but he didn't shy away from um, saying what needed to be said, when it needed to be said, and, and certainly for, for young people in particular, he was, a, he was a colossus, and he's a colossus, I think his legacy will go on, but, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, it, 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 it's a massive loss to our communities in Leicester, mm, and, absolutely. Uh, you know, obviously. Family and everything. Yeah, and all the work that you used to do in Taiwan as well. Because I mean, a couple of times I've been up oh, to Charmwood yeah. Arts was to meet his annual summer cohort of interns that came over from Taiwan. I think he probably did more for building awareness of Taiwanese culture and uh, arts and photography than anyone I've ever come across. Yeah, and of course he brought that all to 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 Loughborough. Really. He, he, he was going back when you know community cohesion was first being. Um, touted by uh, the, the Labour government, the first Labour government of, of Blair. You, you know, Charmwood was a, really a, 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 a cornerstone, really, of, of a lot of community cohesion work. And at the cornerstone of their community cohesion work was Kevin Wright. You yeah. know, he was the one that was instrumental in, in, in making these sorts of connections and in bringing his world vision mm. to a little county town in Leicestershire. And that, that, you know, what, what a task that is, it, isn't it? In a football analogy, that would be like taking, um, I, would, I would say Millwall, but even, but even less that, that'd be like taking sort of OD town to the Champions League. It, it, you know, it, mm. it's that big. It, mm. You know, so, mm. yeah, a massive a massive legacy and hopefully his, well, I know, his, his legacy will continue. 
yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 the best of us. So yeah, wish his family well. Um, I mean, talking about things like you know, as you mentioned there, with Kev, community cohesion and community development. You know, right from the early early days. I mean, bringing it right up to date with the whole kind of COVID nineteen lockdown scenario. I did ask um, Rupal this morning. Um, yeah, we're talking sure. about her, which I think you saw. You know that. Yeah. You know, th- does she feel afterwards that you know this is the one time that suddenly people will come together and do those kind of things? I mean, are you quite hopeful? You know, pessimistic, optimistic, realistic? Um, I, I always think I'm, I'm hopeful, but 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 always realistic, maybe. And I, and I think yes, this is an opportunity, opportunity for so many people. We talked, you know, just before lockdown came in about you know that there may well, and I don't know whether these are the right words, but I can't think of the right words at the time. Whether there's going to be some really good that comes out of this, and mm. that good may well connect us to the social cohesion, mm. social connectedness, and so forth. I guess with my sort of polycourse pat on a little bit, I, I do worry because. Um, you've, I've seen um, some rise in, in certainly on, on online um, anti-Semitic mm, uh, mm. behaviour yet again. Uh, it seems like it's, we're going back to the Black Death in the 1300s, which was, obviously was blamed a lot on Jews at the time. Mm. And the community security just released a, 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 a new document that looks at COVID-19 and, and, and the anti-Semitic behaviour that has come to involved with it, again, blaming Jews. So when you get these sorts of things, and this is just that, I'm just talking about the Jewish community there, when you look at you know the potential um, divisions and the blame culture that's in there, and the, the, the stereotyping and the conspiracy mm. theories and all mm. this sort of stuff, you just hope that people see through that. Um, I'm not always sure that they do, um, but if they do see through that, I do think we we. we do have an opportunity maybe to sort of almost start afresh in terms of looking at the, the sort of commonality of, of, of experiences, human rights, human dignity, um, our, 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 our sort of culture has gone very materialistic and have been materialistic for a long period of time. Maybe the, you know, the saviors of all this have been those real grassroots workers. So maybe in that, I, I hope we'll have um, a, a positive impact, but I think we've always got to be realistic as well. Mm. I want, I want to talk to you about the UN a little bit. So I'll, I'll kind of park that com- uh, to a conversation over Mark Charlton last night about, you know, uh, an organisation that's come off the back of, you know, something quite traumatic like World War Two and the Holocaust in particular. Yeah. So we'll come on to that in a minute. But why, why does this myth around, you know, the, the othering, the easy person to blame, why, do, why does that persist? And why does that persist that it's always... Jews, for, and as a matter what religion it is, they all seem to have. Why is this collective bogeyman kind of being created? What 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 keeps that going? I think that's 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 the crux question, isn't it? Why is it that we we, 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 we tend to focus on the same targets, the, the blame cultures, and, and so forth? And you know, if you look at the history of anti-Semitism, it's riddled with people. And the Jewish community to be blamed for various, for various. The interesting thing with COVID nineteen, of course, is that it's disproportionately affected Jewish communities. There's mm. a higher disproportionate amount of Jewish uh, Jewish people who've suffered as a result of it. So, if this is a worldwide Jewish conspiracy, it seems that we're killing ourselves. It doesn't make a lot of sense, really, does it? So, well, using, you know, well, using that football analogy, it is an own goal. So, yeah, I it's guess. An yeah. Own goal. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I think I think you know. Obviously, people have there's, there's, there's books and there's there's there's, 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 there's the laws for why it is in that. But mm. maybe it's something inherent in in our culture that leads always to look for blame, maybe mm. and, and for quick. Um, um, well, like Hitler said, "Think the bigger the lie, the more people will believe it." So you yeah. know, it's that quick, simple to understand thing that if mm. something goes wrong. You've got to blame somebody, yeah. um, and who is more likely to blame to be to be the people yeah. to blame? Let's have a look at the legacy. Let's look at the past. You know, it's no ins- people do come back to yeah. the Black Death. You know, yeah. thirteen forties as well. There you go. Mm. And it's obviously mm. Jews at that time. So why can't we do the Jews now? Mm. So it's 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 a horrific and it's a horrible recurring aspect. Uh, certainly with regard to anti-Semitism, and of course, mm. you, you know, you look at other other cultures now, other traditions, other religions. I've been blamed for sorts of things, and, and it, 
whether it sort of fits some people's human psyches mm. to, mm. to need somebody mm. to, to actually pin blame on, mm. um, and who are the easier people to do that. Yeah. But when you look at the evidence, you hope that the evidence, you know, when it's put for people, and when they when they try and understand it, you think, well, actually, surely logic says that this is actually my Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Uh, and that's the thing that, that's the thing that I think about quite a lot because um I was watching a documentary the other day and it was just saying this guy was a photojournalist you know and he was on the front line and he got you know cornered by these people and they were like where are you from and he just said well you know he knew if he said he was British he'd add it you know and so if he, and if he said he's American like he would definitely add it so he said he was Irish and they were like oh right Ireland yeah great that's great you know you you're, you hate the British type thing and off he went, you know, full access, not a problem. And it's yeah. it's almost like if you want to survive, you say you're Irish. And if you want to kind of shoot yourself in the foot and you've got a representative of every major religion there, the only religion you could actually mention that would get everybody on your side and get rid of your own sectarian differences would be the, the person was Jewish. Yeah. It's, it's, it's funny though, isn't it? I, mean, I, I, I didn't get, uh, sadly, I didn't get to hear Paul uh, last night, and, and and you know your conversation with him with regards to the trouble. But you know when I, when we were both lads growing up, you know the visions of the Irish amongst lots of British people mm. were very different to what they are now, aren't they? So yeah, and again yeah. that comes down to this yeah. notion of stereotypes, mm. um, racist stereotypes, mm. Mm. easy to understand stereotypes. Mm. You know it's what it's what Hitler based his whole uh, his whole society, his whole racial theory on was was that. Mm. that uh, there needed to be um, a, a constant theme of somebody working behind the scenes to mm. to, to sort of bring down um, uh, racial society, uh, German society at the time. Mm. And the more you say these things, the more mm. you instill it in people's uh, minds, the more you uh, use images, the more you use films, the more you restore history, mm. People then start thinking, oh, actually, there's going to be something in this. And, and mm. it's only when those sorts of regimes come apart and, and that the, the, the other narrative comes forth mm. that we oh, it's crazy. How did, they, how did so many people go and fall for that sort of stuff? But, mm. but they do. Mm. And they continue to do so. And again, this is one of the battles I think we've all got to fight in terms of getting evidence in front of people rather than getting to rely on, on, on stereotypes. Yeah. Let, let, let me ask you something. Uh, we've never really spoke about this subject. Um, uh, only, only, I think we've mentioned it a couple of times. But do you think the whole sort of you know Israel Palestine situation and maybe how it's reported or you know the perceived impact or influence of Israel with America and you know that kind of stuff. You know they, they talk about sort of, you know the Nazi occupation of France. They talk about uh, apartheid. They talk all about these things. Do you think because that situation is ongoing, and I'm not saying it's easy to deal with. Don't get me wrong, and I certainly don't think the president's brother in uh, son in law is going to be able to deal with it. But um, it's a little bit bigger than him, I think, than his MBA course. But I think you know until we deal with that and have some maybe very open and honest conversations about how do we bring some sort of resolution to that um conflict or that ongoing situation would we be able to deal with the broader anti-semitism and maybe then sort of use the holocaust in a way to be able to have those conversations i think so i think because obviously the israeli situation the palestinian situation has become uh, in, in many ways, a modern manifestation of, 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 of other things that have been going on through history. So, you know, when you look at, as we've just said, you know, in terms of COVID-19, one of the conspiracy theories, the anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, that there's some sort of uh, relationship between Israel, the Israeli government, between the United States government, and between our government, who's actually trying to gain an advantage for, 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 for Jewish communities as a result of that. So. It, it is, an, it is a, a sort of, obviously, a very live situation. Mm -hmm. I guess the, the legacy of, 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 of the Middle East and the Israeli situation for me and the Palestinian situation for me is when, you come, when I talk about you know, getting the key narrative through to people, getting people's narrative through to, 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 to the wider public, we need to look at you know, those sorts of grassroots projects that are, that are, that are happening in Israel um, that involve... Arabs, uh, Palestinians, Muslims, Jews, gay citizens, other people. All those sort of grassroots stuff that are about 
about the Pebbing Pebbing line, you know, or, or about basic community cohesion, well, seeing through the sort of uh, the bigger picture in terms of actually seeing what actually is the bigger picture, which is how people relate. Yeah. So yeah, I think I think I think yeah, you've got to look at the Israeli uh, Palestinian situation through both eyes. I think I think that goes without saying, and, and a lot of the time, people don't on, on both sides mm. of the situation. Um, undoubtedly, there are things that are wrong on both sides, and so forth. And again, maybe we need to look. Which we've had, you know, on our own doorsteps in the north of Ireland, you know, these type of situations in terms of what we learn from it. But I think the more we, we, we involve grassroots people mm. in, in 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 giving them the power to be the solution to their problems, mm. the more we'll start to see these stereotypes mm. and these mental mm. blockages breaking down. And that's what we need to do. I think. Yeah, and we covered it a little bit last night with borders, with sort of, you know, the Polisario in Western Sahara, with, you know, the relationship with sort of Morocco. Um, we looked at, you know, Kashmir, places like that, you know, where these things are, are quite active. And there, there are similarities. They're not the same. You know, yeah. there's always similarities, but there's always two sides, probably seven sides to an argument and seven you won't find. Um, and a lot of it um, is driven by resources, as well natural yeah. resources um some more than others and yeah. it's very heavily played by politicians where they play the nationalistic card you know you did this to me 300 years ago so, you know so therefore you know, i'm going to do this to you um yeah. and also playing the sort of the religion card and finding the sort of the bogeyman you know the sort of uh, finding someone to blame it's all wrapped up and so you get these politicians they're all kind of very similar when it comes to how they play the media um, and the, the, the media, I think the mainstream media colludes with that as well, um, yeah. and that, and that role of the one, grassroots. One, yeah, one of the things you just said there just, just strikes on, because I'm, I was thinking as you were speaking of uh, Santayana's famous quote of, you know, those who, who do not learn from history are going to repeat it. Um, and whilst that, is also, that certainly is true, I think in some cases you see people who the failed lessons from history are being repeated. So yeah. people are using history yeah. as a means of actually prolonging current mm. um, divisions and so forth, mm. along the lines of, you know, this was our country originally, so therefore it has to stay our country and so forth, mm. or 400, 500 years ago this happened, and we now need to have our things back. So you think, well, actually, yeah, if you, if you play history out in that context, there will be conflict right across the globe in terms of mm. things there is to a certain extent, you know, in terms of people trying to say, well, that was our original land. You know, imagine that, imagine the Anglo 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 Saxon people of this country who perceive ourselves to be fairly British and sort of being sort of quite Germanic in our tribal roots and so forth, going back to the middle of Germany and so on. Actually, this is Saxony mm. was once our country, therefore we should have Leipzig back. Yeah, you know, it's that type yeah. of analogy. Yeah. That's stupid, who would argue that? But, but actually, these things are being argued in similar ways. Mm. by people using mm. it as a means of, of, yeah. of, of trying to gain one thing up of a problem of another community. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, actually, looking at people drawing on the right part of history uh, or maybe the factual part of history. You know, we were talking last night and we'll be talking later on to Erin, who's nine, about sort of, you know, what she's been studying at primary school with World War Two, and it'll be very, I'm sure it'll yeah, be very fact figures winners, losers, numbers, you know, big key events, uh, but with very little understanding. Yeah. Not that you're meant to have at primary school, I don't mean it like that. I'm just saying that when you then become an adult, where are you actually getting any of that understanding as to what our relationship is with Europe based on the First World War and the Second World War? Sometimes, you know, we, we often use this phrase, don't we? If someone came down and landed from, from Mars, and you try to explain human conflict to them, they will probably be that baffled. Yeah. But I think you don't need people from Mars. If you, if you talk to very young, young, young children about it, they will ask you, and they, or, when they ask these questions, why is that happening? Why was there a war, Dad? Why, why did this country mm. really not like that? You think, you're actually quite hard pressed to come up with an answer that mm. actually is remotely logical. Um, and, and, and real people do it because they ask these questions and they keep asking these questions. Mm. And then when you actually realise what they're saying is actually there is no sense to that. Mm. There is no, absolutely mm. no sense at all to the way we're doing these sort of situation. Yeah. Let's go back to basics with all human beings and deal with it in that way. So I think I think, you know, what 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 you're gonna come up with in a couple of well, let's go a couple of hours now, isn't it? Yeah. You know, is is gonna be fascinating and, and, and you know, the 
all the involved our young people saying, asking those questions, why, what, who, what for, that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. The more we probably at least examine ourselves in terms of our own understanding and then realise that, a lot of stuff we do is like that. Mm. Cool. So, final question. Um, where are you at with your um, latest book project? Because you were mentioning that to me the last time. Um, have you kind of thought any more about it? Um, you know, again, it's that kind of hidden Nazi architecture, isn't it, as you kind of walk around? Yeah, it's, 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 it's partly that. I think hmm. it's, it's, it's the, 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 the projects I've, I've, I've sort of, well, I've done, uh, it's all written up now, and, and <clears throat> is using the photographs that I've taken of, uh, Holocaust related sites right across um, from France all the way up to uh, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, and so forth, of, of, of using contemporary images of Holocaust related sites. So that mm. might well be rest extermination camps, mm. uh, Auschwitz of this world, Sobibor, and Berger, and so forth. It's also looking at uh, transit camps, mm. uh, but it also looks at you know when uh, uh, sites that you can see in, in in the likes of Paris and the likes of Berlin uh, that there are off the beaten track that are you know still exemplars of things that happened once upon a time in mm. these places. A, a good example is Paris. You know, uh, obviously I, I've got no, no idea the millions of people that will visit uh, the Eiffel Tower every year. But on the way to the Eiffel Tower from the nearest Mocha line is uh, the site of an old velodrome where Parisian and French Jews were rounded up, were taken to, um, were taken to a place called Rancy, which is in the suburbs, and then they were shipped out, as you see, on the, on, on the, the passage to the Eastern Europe. And this is on, right on the doorstep of the Eiffel yeah. Tower, but, but unless you knew, unless you know what to look for, you miss these sites. So what I've done is I've tried to sort of use no period photograph at all, but to go to these places, take the images of things that are still quite shocking. So there's the, 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 there's the visual images of, of anti-Semitism, uh, and, but also look at the legacy of it, you mm. know? So, so, you know, when you visit old Jewish graveyards, when you visit uh, the sites of mass graves in the woods of Lithuania uh, and, and Latvia, um, when you visit these places, you're often alone. I'm, 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 it's very seldom that you see a lot of people there. This is not Auschwitz times mm. of millions of people. This is very, very secluded places that you go to on remote bus journeys and tram journeys. And I try to capture what that, that, that looks like to me with the idea that we, we actually tell the story not through words and not through period photographs, but through what people can actually see now. So mm. that's what I'm, um, um, I've been working on. Obviously, we've been we've had a few conversations mm. which mm. we've been paying on me with the board to continue. Uh, because I think, you know, it's important for people to realise that, that, that history is on our doorstep, that, mm. that, that history mm. needs to be examined. Mm. But it's shocking when you see things like um, in, in Woods, for example, in the Polish city of Woods, uh, an old synagogue um, that was obviously wrecked by, by the Nazis when the, the Nazis took over uh, occupied Poland. Um, a, a synagogue that then became a community centre for other communities and now is a Tesco. And you yeah. look at it and you think that does not look like a Tesco. And you look upwards and you see the old tablets of the law, the Ten Commandments, yeah. they're still visible, and you go yeah. past it and you think, that's a bit Unless you actually look for these things. Yeah. And yeah. you realise that actually the community used to go into yeah. that place for something very different than buying their yeah. bread and milk. Um, it, it brings it home. So I'm hoping yeah. that, that this will interest people, and I'm yeah. hoping that, people, that, it, that it makes the Holocaust um, a, a more accessible thing rather than, you know, sometimes it can be inaccessible through books mm. uh, and, and sort of academic uh, uh, tones and so forth. So I'm hoping that this, this actually could bring it home for a lot of people. Yeah. Brilliant. Great. Well, listen, thank you very much for agreeing to talk to me. You're very welcome. Love to see you as always. We need to pick up on the uh, mental health newsroom as well. Yes. Yes, that's cool. important stuff, mate. I look forward to picking that up with you. Excellent. Speak to you soon, my friend. Take care. Yes, mate. Take care now. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye.